I'm going to review some of the techniques and the protocols that we use for the renal Doppler evaluation. I'll review the criteria for assessing renal artery stenosis and renal arterial occlusion, talk about the evaluation of renal stents, talk a little bit about renal infarction and how we might diagnose that with ultrasound, and finish up by talking about some vascular anomalies and injuries. So why use ultrasound for all of these things? Well, we use it because it's non-invasive. There's no radiation or contrast material required. It gives us not only anatomic but also physiologic information. And for some of these diagnoses that we're about to speak about, it allows us to really be specific about the, the hemodynamic significance of a lesion that we see. That can be difficult when, when we do it with CT or MR. The keys to a successful abdominal Doppler study, including the evaluation of the kidneys and the renal arteries, include adequate patient preparation, the use of adequate equipment, certainly operator experience is important, learning some technical shortcuts, as we'll discuss in the next few minutes, knowing their diagnostic criteria, and testing them against uh, another diagnostic test. Having correlation is very important for you to be able to determine how accurate you are with your criteria. In terms of patient preparation, we typically like to have the patients fast before we do our art, renal arterial studies. An overnight fast is usually sufficient. We don't give any other specific preparation. This allows us to reduce the scatter and attenuation from bowel gas so your images don't look like that, and there's no other special medication necessary. In terms of equipment, we like to use our best units. Those, those that have uh, sensitive color, power Doppler, as well as pulse Doppler imaging. Again, the usual frequency range is somewhere between 2.5 to 7 megahertz, depending on the size of the patient. Obviously, if you have a small patient, you can go up in frequency. Very large patients, you're going to want to go down, so you have better depth penetration. And I routinely utilize harmonic imaging because it improves the resolution and the quality of our studies. Here's a quick review of the renal anatomy. Recall that both renal arteries originate from the abdominal aorta below the level of the superior mesenteric artery, and that both of those renal arteries will be hidden sometimes behind the renal veins, which cross anteriorly. And as the renal arteries cross into the hilum of the kidney, you'll see that they branch into the segmental arteries, which will go to specific segments in both kidneys. Now let's start out by talking a little bit about renal arterial disease. The two most common primary diseases are atherosclerosis, which is by far the most common. About 90% of all renal arterial disease is going to be due to atherosclerotic causes. And of course, we should consider fibromuscular dysplasia. Both of these are associated with renal artery stenosis, hypertension, and ischemic nephropathy. If you look at this diagram, you can appreciate that renal artery stenosis, hypertension, and chronic renal failure can occur alone, but there is significant overlap. And so certainly one of the reasons that we explore the diagnosis of renal artery stenosis is to identify for patients with underlying hypertension and who also may be prone to chronic renal failure. As our protocol for the evaluation of the renal arteries, we always start out with a renal survey, looking at the kidneys. Then we'll do a direct examination of both renal arteries, determining the peak systolic velocities at multiple locations, typically from the origin, proximal, mid, and distal segments of each renal artery. And then we finish the renal arterial exam by doing the indirect exam, and that's evaluating the waveforms that we can obtain from the segmental branches from within the hilum of each kidney. So here's a, a look at a kidney in part of our renal survey. Again, we want to evaluate for size, echogenicity, presence of stones, hydronephrosis, or masses. Here in this case of a patient who presented for hypertension, you can see that there's a large mass projecting from the upper pole of the kidney. Obviously an important diagnosis to make, and one you would not want to overlook. And it's also important to recognize that you should turn the color Doppler on, because typically renal cell carcinoma is hypervascular relative to the rest of the normal parenchyma. The direct examination of the renal arteries, again, peak cystic velocities at multiple locations. With atherosclerosis, you'd expect the stenosis to be near the origin or proximal segments of each renal artery. If the patient has underlying FMD, then you'd be more prone to be looking at the more mid and distal portions. So in your younger patients with progressive hypertension, make sure you get a good look at the entire renal artery. 
And as I mentioned for the indirect exam, you want to sample within the hilum of the kidney. We're really focusing on the segmental branches, looking at the waveform shape of the upper, mid, and lower pole regions. And the reason that we take multiple segments from within the kidney is because you may have duplicated arteries, which you may not see on the direct exam, or you may have stenosis of the segmental branches that you may be able to pick up on the indirect exam. So the technique includes having the patient fasting prior to the procedure. Again, lower frequency transducers. Patient positioning is key. You may start out with the patient supine to take a look at the abdominal aorta, but we quickly turn the patient from side to side to find the best acoustic windows. And that really is where the, the time savings can come. And you can be very efficient by finding the best acoustic windows by moving the transducer across the side of the patient finding those windows. And as you'll see, on the right side, it's scanning through the liver. And on the left side, it's scanning through the kidney. And of course, you want to have the patient hold their breath, or at least breathe quietly so you can get adequate waveform samples for your evaluation. So I call those certain money views. You know, those are views that will allow you to get maximum information in a short period of time. The money view for the right renal artery is typically the patient slightly right side up, scanning through the liver, as you see in this example, and here we can see the right renal artery in its entirety, right, from the origin from the aorta into the hilum of the kidney. And so from this one view, we can sweep the sample volume, the angle correct to the direction of flow, through the artery, capturing our peak to size velocities for the evaluation. Now, of course, one of the tricks that we'll talk about in a minute is to observe the color pattern. If you've optimized the color flow pattern in that patient, adjusting the pulse repetition frequency to laminar flow, you'll also see signs of stenosis. For the left side, we like to put the patient left side up, scan through the left kidney, and identify the renal artery from that projection. Now here's a look, scanning at the, the right renal artery through the liver. And again here, I've adjusted my pulse repetition frequency and my gain so that we can see the artery very clearly, and you can see that there's no evidence of aliasing, no elevated peak systolic velocities on the display to suggest that there's an underlying stenosis. And you can follow it all the way in. And you can even appreciate on this example, there's early branching of the renal arteries before the height, but certainly no evidence of stenosis on this display. Here's a look at the left renal artery, again, scanning through the left kidney. You can appreciate the left renal artery as it originates from the abdominal aorta, follow it into the kidney, and also observe the segmental branches, those first major branches coursing into the kidney. And again, from this view, able to obtain all the information from this view. Now, of course, it's important to look for duplicated arteries. They can occur in up to 20% of patients. And the way that we identify the duplicated arteries is by scanning through the kidney along a longitudinal projection. And of course, you can augment that with the axial views as well, looking for multiple vessels. And one of the clues that you have duplicated arteries is when you see one of the arteries going to one of the upper or lower poles, then you must assume that there probably is another vessel supplying the other pole of the kidney. So scanning through the kidney allows you to detect duplicated arteries. Now, as I mentioned, one of the important shortcuts to performing a complete renal duplex examination in a reasonable amount of time is by optimizing the color Doppler. You can see in this example here, we have a change in the color pattern, aliasing at the site of the stenosis in the proximal renal, renal artery. That draws your attention very quickly, so you know where to place the sample volume to get the highest peak systolic velocity that you'll use to characterize the lesion. So spending just a few moments optimizing the color flow exam saves lots of time so you're not fishing with your pulse Doppler sample looking to detect a high peak systolic velocity. So we adjust the color gain, pulse repetition frequency, and wall filter, and normalize to laminar flow. It allows us to screen the vessel quickly, identify flow abnormalities, which we usually would represent aliasing for high velocities, and breweries for a high velocity vascular disturbance. Here's, here's an example in real time where we can see aliasing near the origin of the left renal artery. You can see the focal color change. And again, aliasing represents, represents wraparound, right? We're going across the top of the color velocity scale around the bottom. So the color will change from red to yellow to white to blue as we go around the scale. And that's what we look for on our display. You can also appreciate here a little brewy artifact as, as there is perivascular tissue vibration 
from the very high velocity striping of the tissue. Here's another example of a polar gluey artifact overlies a significant stenosis at the origin of the right renal artery. And one of the ways that we can minimize this artifact is by employing a combination of paradoppler and harmonic imaging, which reduces some of that artifact. You can appreciate a very tight focal stenosis at the origin of that right renal artery. Other technical shortcuts to remember in your examination is to make sure you use a small sample volume, usually two to three millimeters, that you're going to place within the vessel in the area of interest. We're going to angle correct to 60 degrees or less so that we don't have artifactually elevated peak systolic velocities. And make sure we have adequate samples for review where we can appreciate and determine the peak systolic velocity at each segment. Okay, this brings up our first question. Can you name this artifact? The arrow is pointing to the renal artery. And is this mirror image, spectral broadening, ring down artifact, a color twinkle, or alias? Yes, if, if you have an understanding of artifacts, obviously it doesn't fit most of these. Those of you who thought it might be a color twinkle, that's typically seen with calcification, typically in the setting of, of, a, of a renal mass or a renal calcification. You usually wouldn't see a long segment of, of, of abnormality. Here we see aliasing that occurs within the artery at the site of the stenosis. Now, in terms of the Doppler criteria that we use for determining renal artery stenosis, here's just a brief sample of, of, of some of the uh, papers that have been published, and you know, they looked at different criteria, peak systolic velocity, renal aortic ratio, tardis parvus waveforms, resistive index, and you can see that there's variable results. Some papers talk about very high sensitivities and specificities, and some much less. But let me just simplify. There really are just a few criteria that we need to know for the renal artery exam. For the direct evaluation, we typically use a combination of the renal aortic ratio, which is the peak systolic velocity in the renal artery at the site of the stenosis compared to the peak systolic velocity in the abdominal aorta obtained at the same level. And that should be greater than 3.5 for a significant stenosis. We can look for peak systolic velocity in the stenosis greater than 200 centimeters per second. And these function very much like they would for the carotid exam. I don't know how many of you do carotid Doppler studies, but the peak systolic velocity tends to be more sensitive and the ratio Think about the ICACC ratio, the renal aortic ratio also tends to be more specific. So in combination, they tend to work very well. And of course, for the indirect exam, we're going to look at the waveform shape from the hilum. Now, there are some limitations to the direct exam. In about 8 to 10% of studies, they may be limited because the patient is very large, there might be too much bowel gas, the patient may not be cooperative, or they can't suspend respiration. But in the rest of your patients, you should do pretty well. Here is our next question. Which peak systolic velocity measurement is associated with a hemodynamically significant renal artery stenosis? And the answer is 200 centimeters per second. Certainly if it's over that, you would consider it to be a significant stenosis, but the cutoff is 200. Now, what about accessory arteries? It's always been sort of, you know, one of, one of the put downs of renal doppler is that if, well, what, what if you don't see all the branches? Well, studies have shown that it's not important to see the small accessory vessels. In one study published by Ron Booty from Michigan in radiology, he said accessory renal artery stenosis is extremely infrequent, less than 1%. And in a study published in AJR, he says that accessory renal artery stenosis are not a direct cause of hypertension. So I don't think we need to worry about that too much. Now, in terms of the indirect exam, we talked about so we want to sample and characterize the waveforms obtained from the hilum. Because this will allow us to find stenosis in case we don't see it on the direct exam. And as I mentioned, it might be helpful to find a stenosis in a duplicated artery or in a segmental artery. And overall can help us improve the detection of renal artery stenosis. Now the normal intrarenal waveform should have a rapid systolic upstroke, essentially perpendicular to the baseline. We should have a low resistance pattern because the kidney demands continuous forward flow throughout the cardiac cycle. And we usually can find an early systolic compliance peak, although we may not see that in everybody. And if we have an abnormal hilar waveform, the so-called tardis parvus waveform, we can see it sort of has a slow rise to peak systole. It has a TP appearance, as you see here in our example. You can see it's a rounded waveform, a delayed systolic upstroke. You lose the early systolic compliance peak. You would have a delayed acceleration time or time to peak and a reduced slope or acceleration index. And we look for these waveforms distal to a significant stenosis. And in fact, we can see this abnormal waveform 
in all arterial systems that have significant stenosis or occlusion. It was popularized, popularized originally with renal Doppler. And here are the, the numbers that you can utilize if you want to characterize the TARDIS Parvus waveform by acceleration time or index. Personally, I like to observe the waveforms and compare them from side to side. In this example, you can appreciate on the side with the stenosis, the TARDIS waveform has a very abnormal contour with a delayed rise to peak systole compared to the contralateral side that has a rapid systolic upstroke and an early systolic compliance peak. And sometimes just comparing both sides can make the diagnosis relatively easy. One important caveat to remember, though, is that you will not always see TARDIS parvus waveforms in patients with underlying renal artery stenosis. This is another paper that Ron Booty had published where he showed that you may not see TARDIS parvus waveforms in patients that have calcified non-compliant vessels. So that's an important pitfall. One to remember is that you don't always see TARDIS parvus with renal artery stenosis. Let's look at some examples. Here's a patient that presented with hypertension, elevated velocities in the right renal artery over 380, compared to about 90 in the aorta. And here's the hyla. Again, TARDIS waveform. It has everything you need to make a significant renal artery stenosis. Here's an example of duplicated arteries. Notice that the waveforms that we obtain on the right side are different. From the lower part, we have a nice rapid systolic upstroke, but we have a slow rise to systole in the midpole region, indicating that waveform is coming from a different vessel. And we sent this patient to MR, and you can see here on the contrast-enhanced examination that there was a vessel supplying the mid and upper pole regions that had a significant stenosis. So even if you found the one main vessel here, the abnormal hyla waveform clued you in that there was going to be a second vessel with a significant stenosis. Here's my last question. TARDIS parvus waveforms are characterized by a reduced acceleration time, are related to a transtenotic pressure reduction, are not seen in all patients with renal artery stenosis, demonstrate an early systolic compliance peak, or have a rapid systolic upstream. It's not seen, and that's important. So we don't rely on the indirect examination alone, because then we will undercall significant stenosis. A few more examples. Here's a patient, 60 years old, hypertension. They'll all start to look the same. Aliasing at the side of the stenosis. Elevated velocity seen on our spectral waveform. And of course, here's another example of a, of a very slow rise to peak systole in the highlight. Here's an example of stenosis involving the right renal artery. Appreciate the aliasing in the vessel. High velocities, parvus parvus. And on the left, high velocities in the stenosis. Tardis parvus waveform, and look at the contralateral side. I'm going to bring it up now. Look at the difference between the left and the right. See, the right side has a good upstroke, early systolic compliance peak. The left side does not. So it's a rounded Tardis waveform, looks like a T peak. Now, here's a patient where we see stenosis in the mid portion of the right renal artery. What does that make you think about? Well, it makes you think about fibromuscular dysplasia. Young lady, progressive hypertension, you can appreciate here. There's the beaded appearance in the mid portion of the right renal artery. You can also appreciate the fact that there are also areas of FMD involving both common iliac artery, or external iliac artery. Now here's some data that we derived from looking at over 3,000 patients in our series. And it just shows that, that the peak systolic velocity tends to be the most sensitive criterion. And if you combine it with the renal aortic ratio, you can see that it increases the specificity. So if you have both, you're very confident. The patient has significant renal artery stenosis. TARDIS waveforms are also very specific, but not seen in all cases. And the resistive index is like flipping a coin. So although we talk about resistive index for a lot of different things, and John Cronin just talked about the value of the resistive index in chronic renal disease, um, it's not specific uh, for any particular disease, and certainly not going to be specific for the diagnosis of renal artery stenosis. Now, it's gained some, some attention and controversy because there's a paper in the New England Journal that said that patients that have elevated resistive index may not respond to revascularization with renal artery stenosis. And so many nephrologists wanted to know what the resistive index and would not choose to treat those patients that had an elevated RR. But many studies have since come out and said that may not be so. Here's one from the Journal of Ultrasound of Medicine that said the RI is not a useful parameter in predicting renal function outcome. So this remains a controversial point. 
Here was a 17-year-old that presented with a worsening hypertension and started with magnetic resonance and geography. And before we sent this patient for inv invasive treatment, we wanted to make sure that it was truly hemodynamically significant. And here we have the study that was performed in this young lady. Elevated velocities off the scale, air lacing over 300 centimeters per second. Look at the color blue artifact as well overlying the vessel. As we move the sample line through the stenosis, mark post-stenotic turbulence, another important sign of a hemodynamically significant lesion, and of course, TARDIS waveforms. We had everything to convince us this was indeed a tight stenosis, and the patient went off for treatment. Another important point to remember is that Doppler is also very good at following patients after stent placement. In fact, I find this to be my preferred evaluation in patients with renal stents. We can see them on ultrasound, we can, we can see blood flow through the stents, and we can determine peak systolic velocities to see if there's in-stent restenosis. Before the stent is placed, we can see hyla waveforms, and after success, successful stent placement, you can see a return to a normal hyla waveform. So another way to follow patients after stents. Here was a study that we did some years ago where we were able to determine peak systolic velocity and renal aortic ratio cutoffs for determining instant restenosis, a velocity greater than 240 centimeters per second and a renal aortic ratio greater than 3.2 would determine instant restenosis in these patients. There was a patient that had a renal stent placed, but the hypertension did not improve. Color Doppler shows brewery artifact overlying the stent with velocities way over 500 centimeters per second. So the stent wasn't placed properly, it needed to be revised. And upon revision, you can see that the peak systolic velocity now is within the normal range and the normal hyalur waveform. And I would be remiss if I don't review with you the normal peak systolic velocity range in the renal artery. The normal velocity range should be between 60 and 100 centimeters per second, same as the abdominal aorta. So you need to know what your normal velocity range is. Just a couple of quick things before I quit. For renal artery occlusion, obviously it's chronic. You'll have a small atrophic kidney. The renal artery will not be visible on your color display. And you may see some intrarenal flow that may be related to collaterals. And that intrarenal flow will be very damped. Here's a patient that had an aneurysm from the renal artery and went on to have an embolization performed. And the patient developed pain after embolization. You can see here on our paradoppler display, this is very poor perfusion of the upper pulse. This patient developed an infarct in the upper pole following the procedure, and here we see it's confirmed on CT, and you can see here the coils placed within the aneurysm. Here's another example of a patient with an infarct. See, again, power doppler, very sensitive for tracking flow in small vessels, and you can see absence of perfusion in the upper pole. The patient had atrial fibrillation, again, confirmed on the CT scan. A few words about renal veins. Normally, flow in the renal veins should be pulsatile, should be phasic, that represents the vegetation from the right atrium. So we should have a biphasic pattern. In patients with renal vein thrombosis, typically in the acute phase, the renal vein is distended, and there's absence of flow in the vein. If you do see flow, it's typically non-phasic. In the patient with renal cell carcinoma and invasion of the renal vein, you may see absence of the renal vein or compression of the renal vein. And those are important findings to assess and also to be able to stage the degree of malignancy. I mentioned renal arteries. Again, they're very uncommon, typically involving the extra-renal portion of the artery. They can be true aneurysms, which you see in patients with FMD or LS danlos. And typically, repair is, is recommended when it's at least 1.5 to 3 centimeters. Here was a patient that had a renal artery embolization and presented for follow-up after coiling. And you can see here there's a good result. There was no evidence of flow within the aneurysm, and we can see the artifact from the coil. Pseudoaneurysms may also occur. They're also uncommon, typically seen after some trauma, which could be related to surgery or biopsy, but may also be seen with inflammatory neoplastic problems, and they will also typically be treated with embolization or with large enough surgery. This is an interesting case that we had very recently. Here was a patient that had uh, a pseudoaneurysm, but the initial sonogram called it a simple cyst. It looks like a simple cyst. It was only if the patient was sent back that we repeated the study, and we see that we're turning the color on, it filled in with color. And here it is on the non-contrast CT, which is also non-diagnostic because we could not see the enhancement of the pseudoaneurysm. Here's an example of an AD malformation on color Doppler. Again, you're going to see a tangle of vessels 
within the kidney with communications to the artery and the vein. And when you sample these, these vessels, very high velocity, low resistance blood flow, typical of arterial venous malformations that occur anywhere in the body. So with that, I'll conclude. Atherosclerotic lesions are usually proximal. But remember with FMD, they can be mid to lateral in location, elevated velocities greater than 200 centimeters per second, and a renal aortic ratio greater than 3.5 is consistent with a significant stenosis. Tardis parvus waveforms are helpful to identify occult stenosis in the main duplicated or segmental branches, but you may not always find Tardis waveforms in patients that have non-compliant calcified vessels. Remember that multiple non-invasive techniques are useful for the evaluation of univascular disease. We can have a very high success rate with ultrasound. Remember, ultrasound is safe, non-invasive, without contrast or radiation, and can determine the hemodynamic significance of a lesion that we see. But for any modality, whether it be CT, MR, ultrasound experience is going to be your most important factor. 